It's my pleasure to open the talk of Andre Bauer. Uh, Bauer is a professor of computational mathematics at the University of Ljubljana here in Slovenia. His work is on the foundation of mathematics, computable and constructive mathematics, type theory, and programming languages. He's particularly known for his work on homotopy type theory and programming with algebraic effects. He's also interested in mathematical art, and you can see some of his and his students' work at the exhibition in Porto Roche. He will be speaking on the dawn of formalized mathematics. Thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing working. I should probably do this one. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Yes, it's okay, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to address this audience today. Um, and I decided to tell you about formalized mathematics. It's something I've been working on for a while now. And I think it's a, an important topic. And also, um, my talk is going to be non-technical. I don't think it's... Uh, appropriate to try to uh, <coughs> flex muscles at uh, such a forum and, 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 and do technically demanding things. But I would li instead like to present something that I think is going to be very significant for the mathematical community in the future. Um, by the way, uh, you can, uh, there we go, you can download the slides um, at my blog. And I think I also posted the link on, on chat so that you can more easily follow the talk. And the slides also have uh, speaker notes, um, which should prove to be helpful, I think. OK, um, so uh, before I say anything else, I should probably explain what I mean by formalized mathematics. Um, there's a very old idea going back to Leibniz um, in the 17th century. Um, of Characteristica Universalis, which is, uh, for Leibniz, this was an imagined completely precise language and a diagrammatical system that would be able to express mathematical, scientific, and metaphysical concepts. And this idea has, throughout history, caught the attention of many people and sparked interest, and it never quite died out. Uh, and then, around 200 years later, mathematicians made first serious progress in formalization. Um, so one important uh, stepping stone was Gottlob Frege's um, Begriffschrift. Uh, this was a diagrammatical, formal, completely precise language for expressing mathematical statements. Um, not too long after that, um, Bertrand Russell and uh, Alfred Whitehead, um, uh, at, this was at the beginning of the 20th century, produced the monumental work Principia Mathematica, where they uh, sought to show that all of mathematics can be reduced to pure logical principles and symbolism. And this work was very inspiring for the development of formal logic in the 20th century. And here they actually tried to uh, develop um, foundations or basics of mathematics in this very formal style. And then as uh, Things developed in uh, the 20th century with the rise of uh, first order logic, Zermelo Frank's and Zermelo Frankel set theory and other formalisms. It became clear that not only could mathematics be formalized completely, but once it is formalized and once the proofs are written down in this formal language, they can be checked mechanically and completely. And it was stated and believed that this can indeed be done for all of mathematics and various experiments, small experiments, would show that, yes, you can do it. But the question remained whether it could be realistically done on a large scale. And there is no other way of answering the question than to try. So the next important step, which I heard about when I was a student, was a formalization of an entire book of analysis. And this book was uh, Landau's Grundlagen der Analysis. The book was quite um, appropriate for formalization because the book itself is very detailed and it's, it's quite formalistic in the way it's written and it has, it, it has very careful arguments. 
Um, my teachers never told me who did this, but it was implied that this was a, a heroic and a slightly insane task, which only demonstrated what everybody knew already, namely that yes, mathematics could indeed be written in a completely formal language. And it was also made understood that now that the point had been made, we could all just proceed with business as usual and forget about further formalization of mathematics because there is no value in doing so. It's just a waste of time. That at least is very much the feeling, the impression I got when I was a student. Uh, well, but I ended up doing a PhD in logic, so I wasn't really uh, listening that well. Um, thanks to... Um, so I later learned that the uh, formalization was carried out by uh, Bert Juting uh, from the Netherlands. He used the automat proof checker, um, and this was in the 1970s. Um, the source code was uh, luckily preserved by Freik Weideck, who also re-implemented automat in C in the 90s. So we can still verify Landau's book using the original formalization of Juting today and it's instant the entire book is you press enter and then the machine says yep the whole book is correct um, so you can see on the right what the formal language of automat looked like so in a sense this was a heroic and somewhat insane undertaking and if you look carefully the top line states that multiplication is associative which is that's uh, what is this? 226, and this is that's 222, sorry, excuse my German. Anyhow, you can see here in beautiful German fracture that it is indeed about multi associativity of multiplication. And if you look at the code, you will be able to tell that it is indeed about multiplicativity of, it's, a, it's about associativity of something called TS, and um, the proof seems completely incomprehensible. So Automat was revolutionary and it was way ahead of its time and it made an important point, but I think it wasn't really possible to use it on a large scale. It really, my teachers really were correct to do, try to do mathematics seriously in this form was out of the question. So what happened next? Well, computer scientists, uh, not, not so much mathematicians, but mostly computer scientists, um, worked on uh, f making formalized mathematics practical. And eventually the idea of a proof assistant emerged. This is a program which assists a human in formalization of mathematics through an interactive process and together the human and the machine produce mathematics, which is, uh, which is the kind of mathematics that humans want to do, but it is completely verified in every detail because the machine is responsible for that part. So over the decades, various designs were explored. And what you saw going by while I was talking were some fragments of code from the most well-known proof assistants. Um, and one thing to notice is that there is a significant progress since Automat because you can more or less read these definitions. I mean, they are a bit strange, but you can kind of guess what is what, and it's not out of the question that somebody would use this. Um, okay, so we have these proof assistants. Computer scientists have been developing them now for, well, 50 years. Um, and uh, the next thing that I would like to explain is how they work, because uh, if and when you face them, it's good to know what's behind the scene. Now, these are complex pieces of software, and there are many aspects of their design, ranging from a user interface to everything else. Um, very computer science-y things, but uh, we shall focus here just on the things that are relevant and interesting to mathematicians. So how does the proof assistant work? Now, it is important to keep in mind that um, the real challenge is not the verification itself. I mean, already Automat showed that once we do possess the formal proof, the f then it is easy to check whether it is correct. Um, it really is a question of com human computer interaction. That's the challenge. The challenge is how to make human and machine cooperate on mathematics, given the gap in how humans perceive and work in mathematics and what computers can understand. So uh, to get some idea, 
what has been done in proof assistance and what has been developed, let us look at a concrete example. Um, read the following mathematical statement. Do you understand it? Yes, well, of course you understand it. You're a mathematician, right? You can also tell that it's blatantly true. It doesn't really need much thought. Yet, from a formal point of view, the statement is, uh, not, quite in a, is not quite exact. In fact, it is inexact. It omits a number of details. These details don't matter, and your brain can recover them automatically if so desired. But it's perhaps surprising how many details are filled in when they need to be filled in. And the reason I'm explaining this is because this is what a proof assistant must be able to do in order to understand the human. The human is not a robot. The human will continue to speak the way that they are used to speak. So let's try to fill in some details here and see what needs to be done. Well, okay, so first of all, F is obviously some sort of a map and it would be nice if we could uh, explicate its domain and codomain. And because it says linear, we're presumably thinking of linear maps between vector spaces. So the next, the next thing that you would maybe write that is a little more exact would be something like this. You would say, if U and V are vector spaces and F and U, and F is a map from U to V, which is linear, then, okay, so then what? Well, then 2F of 2X plus Y equals 2X plus F of Y. Um, but notice also that we put in, uh, we explicitly quantified X and Y, and we said X and Y range over U. Well, how did we know that X and Y range over U? That's because we have F of X and F of Y. So if F maps from U and we're going to apply it to X, then X better be an element of U. So here we guessed that X and Y are supposed to range over U because otherwise the statement wouldn't make any sense. We're not done. So, First of all, these two vector spaces, they must be over some field, a vector space is over a field, and this field has so far not been mentioned. Well, we're not bothered by that because we all, that we all know that there is some ambient field that maybe later on it will turn out to be a particular one. It somehow doesn't matter. Nevertheless, if we wanted to make this explicit, then the next stage would be something like this, right? You would just say, okay, suppose K is a field, and then you would proceed by saying U and V are vector spaces over K. You see what is going on here? As we're adding more and more detail to the statement, it gets harder and harder <laughs> to understand the gist of it. It's just getting lost in the bureaucracy. So there is a good reason why people prefer concise imprecision than obfuscated precision. Um, and by the way, we are not nearly done. We need to go on. So what else is missing? Well, to be precise, uh, U and V are vector spaces, so they're structures, right? So they, can, they, have, they have parts, like the operation and the underlying carrier set and so on. And strictly speaking, we need to distinguish between U and its carrier set, which I wrote here as absolute value of U. So the map F really maps from U to V, the carrier sets, and X and Y don't literally range over U, they range over the carrier sets. Um, there's another possibility here for F. We could also say that F is a uh, morphism from U to V in the category of vector spaces, in which case we would write F, U, arrow, V. Um, but then F wouldn't be a map because a morphism in the category of vector spaces is a map on the carrier set together with the fact that it is a linear map. So such an F would be a little structure that has an underlying function the morphism has an underlying map and the fact that it's linear, in which case then we would have to write something like the absolute value of F for the carrier of F. Okay, you might think we're done, but we're not done because, uh, for instance, if you look at this number two here, the numeral, is that supposed to be a natural number? Well, it can't be literally a natural number because it has to be an element of K. And also, why are we using plus? for addition both in U and V, that seems imprecise. So we would have to do maybe something like this. We need, to, we need to annotate the various parts to tell where they're coming from. So for instance, maybe you need to write a subscript K on the two so that it's clear that what you mean is two embedded into K via the canonical map, say from integers to, to K. Um, 
or it's the addition of the unit of k with itself, something like that. And then also the, op the, vector, the vector space operations need to be tagged. Um, so, okay, that's the sort of thing that we do. Well, I don't think pe people actually do this. They can do it if they want to. But if we ever hope to formalize things, then we need programs, programs that can do this sort of thing or else we will have to explain, keep explaining the, the, the machine details that will completely obfuscate uh, the narrative and, and what we want to do. This process of um, going from uh, the simple statement to the more uh, exact one is called elaboration. Um, and uh, it is part, this is a typical part of implicit mathematical knowledge that is passed on by observation, you observe your seniors to see what they do. And by imitation, you, you know, you're on your written exam or an oral exam, you pretend that you know how to do this and then eventually you know how to do this. But this is rarely talked about among mathematicians explicitly. And it's not even talked about among logicians. Logicians are not interested in formalizing this part of mathematical knowledge, at least not the logicians of the 20th century because they were preoccupied with other problems that were more relevant at the time. Nevertheless, somebody has to attack this sort of question um, because elaboration is an essential part of modern proof assistance. It is the bridge between the human and the machine. The people who uh, thought about this very seriously were computer scientists because they faced similar issues of human computer interaction in the design of programming languages. And there the question is how to allow the programmer to express ideas, programming, in a very direct way that is not overly uh, verbose. You, you, you want to be able, you want to give the programmer the ability to express ideas directly and concisely, much like the math a mathematician would want. And so these techniques have names. You know them uh, from your everyday life. You know, an assumed ambient field key K, well, that's just called the existential variable in, uh, in the formal elaboration uh, um, terminology. Or guessing that X ranges over U, that's called type inference. Automatically changing uh, a vector space to its carrier set as needed, that's called an implicit coercion or just some, sometimes a coercion. So these are techniques that have been developed mostly by computer scientists and that modern proof assistants uh, include and also many others that I haven't mentioned yet. So if and when you learn your first proof assistant, it's going to look scary because they will be saying strange things like type inference and implicit argument. But keep in mind that you have already seen all of this. It's just been given names and it has been made mathematical. And that's a good thing. You might be curious to see how the statement is written in a modern proof assistant. So here it is in lean. That's one of uh, very popular proof assistants. Um, if you look at this, you will say, well, OK, it's not English. It's not too bad. You can, you, can, you, can, you can see what's going on. I mean, for some reason, they keep writing type star. Some, there are some square brackets. We don't understand why some brackets are square and some are not. Obviously, somebody imported the linear algebra package or, so, or something. But all in all, it's not, it's not worse than LaTeX. I mean, that's a very good sign. It's not worse than LaTeX. It's maybe even better than LaTeX. Um, and by the way, the last line is how you prove the statement. You see, this is an obvious statement. If you have to spend time proving obvious statements for the benefit of the machine, that's a no-go. That's a showstopper. So it's a good thing that uh, proof assistants allow a great deal of automation. And so something like this can be handled by a tactic which is called SIMP, that, stells, that um, stands for simple. OK, let's go on. Um, so uh, we have seen this elaboration part. Now let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at, um, Oh, sorry, I just mixed up my things here. OK, so let's have a look at uh, how uh, a, a typical proof assistant is structured. There are many proof assistants. Not all of them follow this particular philosophy, but most do. And this 
has uh, turned out to be a, a good way to design them. Now, of course, a proof assistant has to contain some sort of formalism because it's about formalizing mathematics. But the important bit is that there are two formal languages in a proof assistant. One is called the vernacular and the other one is the core formalism. Um, the vernacular is designed for humans. It is an expressive language that um, facilitates the expression of mathematics the way that humans are used to doing. So it will support common mathematical notations, it will provide support for automation, and it's generally going to accommodate the user. Uh, at the same time, it needs to be exact because it needs to be understandable by the machine. So it's, it's, it's a strange mix of, of something that tries to make the human happy and something that is still understandable by the machine. It's usually quite elaborate and it contains lots of possibilities for organizing your mathematics and so on. We have already seen that there is an elaboration process and this is called, well, the elaborator does that. It's part of a proof assistant. Uh, and it translates the vernacular to uh, a core formalism. The user almost never sees the core formalism. Unless you are a developer of a proof assistant, you are not going to look at the core formalism. But it is the underlying mathematical foundation. It's the thing that people think of as when they say, oh, yes, there is a mathematical foundation. So it should be something that is well understood by logicians and mathematicians so that there is no question about what kind of foundation we're using. And it should also be free of unnecessary complexity. It is important that this formalism is simple. It's, so maybe when you translate from the vernacular to the core formalism, you're going to incur some large factor, like maybe the code becomes 10 times longer. It doesn't matter. The machine can take it. Nobody needs to read it. The important thing is that it is well understood and manageable, and it is designed for computer processing. It's not designed for humans to look at. Now, the actual verification is carried out by a special component of a proof assistant, which is usually called the kernel. Uh, this component checks formal proofs. Uh, so it doesn't perform any automated tasks. That's part of the vernacular. Um, it's just served the actual proofs and constructions and definitions. And the only thing it has to do is verify that they follow whatever formalism is uh, used by the proof assistant. It is important to understand that this is the only critical component of a proof assistant. So the vernacular might be tens and tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code, but it doesn't matter if there is a bug in there. At, well, a bug is annoying, but it doesn't matter as far as mathematical correctness is concerned. If there is a bug in the kernel, however, then mathematical correctness may be compromised. So these are typically designed to be very small pieces of code you know, some of them are just a couple of hundreds of lines of code. Some of them venture into several thousand lines of code, which is not a lot. Um, and then they are carefully audited because that's the thing where we put our trust in. OK, we haven't really spoken about what the core formalism is. What foundation do proof assistants use? Well, here logicians have an opinion. And if you ask a uh, any mathematician in the street, you know what the answer will be. They're going to say, well, of course, set theory is the, uh, is the generally accepted foundation of mathematics. And this indeed was the case in the 20th century, and it helped relate all and, uh, and connect all branches of mathematics. The fact that there was a common ground, a common foundation uh, that also served as a lingua franca uh, in mathematics was immensely important for the development of mathematics. So this is an old and venerable and well understood foundation, which almost all proof assistants ignore. Instead, they use type theory. Um, type theory was originally proposed by Bertrand Russell. And then subsequently, there were several incarnations of type theory. Uh, there was Church's simple type theory, then there was Martin Loeff's type theory, and then by now we have many variations and derivations of various kinds of type theory. It's a, it's a small industry in the computer science 
um, community because uh, type theory also gets used a lot, quite a bit, in, in, for computer science purposes. In any case, it's a matter of observation that uh, most proof assistants use type theory underneath. Uh, why that is the case is maybe uh, we can, it's interesting to speculate, but it's not something that I want to spend a lot of time on, but I'm happy to discuss this. And I wrote an answer on math overflow a while ago where I tried to explain these points more carefully. It's linked uh, in the speaker notes. It seems, but let, nevertheless, let me see how am I doing on time. Oh, I'm doing fine. So I can, I, I can say a few words about this, okay? So why don't, why don't proof assistants use set theory? My first answer is that this is not a matter of philosophy or political conviction or adherence to tradition or trying to break with tradition. This is a very, very pragmatic point. When, you are, when you're trying to design a proof assistant, you have so many problems on your hands, then trying to be political about your choice of foundation is the last thing on your mind. So you just want to take something that works well. And from what we know, it seems that type theory is in fact a better fit for how informal, mathematic, informal mathematics is done than formal set theory. Mind you, the thing that you write in your papers is quite far removed from what logicians call formal Zermelo set theory. And that's the thing you would have to implement in your proof assistant if you wanted to use it. You have to implement formal set theory. And there are layers and layers of coding which don't really help anything, you know, like the Kuratowski pairing and you need to encode natural numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is not really helping with anything. So it's, so instead, um, the designers typically opt for type theory. Another feature of type theory is that more naturally supports large scale organization of math. And this is very important when you start organizing larger, large libraries of mathematics. In addition, uh, software engineering, uh, which deals with how to organize large amounts of source code has something to say there and also uses type theoretic methods. So there's an additional benefit there. You can, we can learn from software engineering. Um, one small detail is that type theory uh, treats any kind of construction on equal footing as a proof. So usually uh, in set theory and first order logic, all statements are existential. You don't actually ever construct anything. Now, of course, you can construct things by introducing new constants, which you can then eliminate and so on. But it's good to uh, have from the start good support for expressing uh, uh, constructions. I mean, everything from ranging inductive constructions uh, to any other kinds of, of constructions. Those are primitive in type theory. And then so they are Im immediately use usable uh, without any additional um, acrobatics and, and uh, in translation. Uh, another very, very important point is that uh, uh, a proof assistant must be able to detect not only mathematical errors, but it must also detect typical human errors while you do mathematics. So in set theory, it might be sensible to say something stupid, like the sine function is an element of the set, which contains numbers seven and five. It's a sensible statement to say that the sine function is an element of any set, because you can always say that might be false, but it's sensible. But it's not helpful if the machine accepts that sort of thing. In fact, it's really, I mean, quite uh, strange. So for instance, in, in, in set theory, formal set theory, if you have a function f, and it's a function of one argument, you're free to apply it to two arguments, and you will get a sensible result. And somehow, proof assistants need to be able to cope with that. Um, and, and so set theory supports better support for, has better support for that, I think. Um, uh, have a look at my math overflow uh, answer where I uh, elaborated on that point. Okay, so if proof assistants have been built and used apparently by some people, um, there's still the obvious question for the mathematician, which is why formalize at all? Uh, I mean, what are you going to gain from formalization? Well, um, people have been drawn to formalization for various reasons. So let me show you some, and I'm going to do here uh, proofs. You see, this is not a mathematical talk. It's it's a talk about uh, it's it's a, it's a talk about uh, um, social norms and social activities of uh, 
of a community, so I should use appropriate methods. So my method is going to be proof by authority and uh, peer pressure. Uh, so why do, why do people formalize? I mean, it looks like little would be gained by doing that. I mean, you, you get to know that your, your theorems are correct, but is that so important? Okay, so first of all, there are situations in which it is not realistic uh, that we would be able to check uh, proofs by hand. Uh, even if you had a, a, a whole army of mathematicians, it would still be unrealistic that they would spend the time checking some horrible long proof. Um, let me give you three examples. So the famous four-color theorem was uh, initially proved with uh, the assistance of a computer program that performed a large number of uh, a search and and it it, it uh, checked uh, a number of configurations and and made sure that they were okay. They were counted in the thousands, and then it said, "Yep." The four-color theorem holds, but nobody proved that the program worked and that it was free of mistakes, which it wasn't. By the way, if you write any, any, any reasonable program, there's going to be a bug in them, in it. So uh, a similar situation uh, appeared a bit later uh, with the Kepler, uh, with uh, Tom Hales's proof of the Kepler uh, sphere packing conjecture, where it took a long time to publish the proof because it contained some programs written, I think, in C that were checking many, many uh, uh, nonlinear inequalities using floating points, and the referees didn't know what to do about that. Now, there were uh, subsequently there were formalization efforts to formalize these two proofs. Uh, George Contier, with his team, formalized it in 2005, and this theorem is now completely verified in, verified in the Koch proof assistant. So the entire theorem, including all the programs, are proved to be correct, including the execution of the program, which then finds some number, large number of critical configurations that is beyond the scope of a single human. I mean, I suppose you could check 633 configurations, but the, the time you, by, by the time you get to 633, you, you, you only have a vague memory of what you were doing two days ago. So it's certainly better that such proofs are done using computer help. And uh, the Kepler uh, packing conjecture was verified in another proof assistant called HOL Lite, including the nonlinear equalities without using any floating points. They were using precise interval arithmetic with uh, precise error bounds. An important motivation for the use of proof assistants also comes from computer science. In fact, computer scientists are way ahead of mathematicians in using proof assistants, um, especially in uh, verifying systems which it, for which security and reliability is of utmost importance. Um, and um, the, what they do there is that they, they take a large system and they formally verify that it works correctly. That is to say, each line of code, each piece of design, they state a little theorem about it, uh, about how what it's supposed to do, and then they prove that that code actually does what it's supposed to do. And so what you end up with is thousands and thousands of extremely boring theorems, each of which is probably quite easy, but is difficult to compose the whole thing into a coherent whole, and it is impossible to prove all those theorems by hand. You would never want to do that. So one such noteworthy example is Compsert, which is a completely verified optimizing C compiler, which verifies everything from parsing, code generation, code optimization, including the execution on several uh, processor um, architectures. So this has all been verified. And so these are the kinds of proofs that we cannot do by hand, and we must use proof assistance. There are also people who have simply lose, lost trust in humanity. So uh, here are two quotes. Vladimir Vovodsky in 2014 wrote uh, when he was lamenting about how in some of his celebrated proofs mistakes were found later, years after they were published. And he said, and who would ensure that I did not forget something and did not make a mistake if even the mistakes in much more simple arguments take years to uncover. And for him, this was a turning point and he turned away from the Fields Medalist work he was doing and start devoted himself to finding a new way of doing mathematics, which he eventually found by um, creating a new foundation and 
using proof assistance to do it. Um, so uh, another such example, which is a more recent, is Peter Scholz's challenge to formalize mathematics, where he explains that he uh, produced a proof, but then he agonized over it because he, it was so complex that he couldn't quite see whether it was correct. It was probably correct. It was impossible to get anybody else to check it. Uh, it was probably good, in, but nevertheless, there were some lingering doubts. And so he thought it would be really nice if somebody could formalize this cutting edge recent uh, theorem of his that he considered very important. So it was a new result. It wasn't an old book of Landau's on addition of numbers. This is real stuff. He said, can you formalize this? So this is showing people who have sort of surpassed what humans can do. Um, another way to uh, view this uh, uh, sentiment, maybe a little more positively, is to say, well, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to break the one mind barrier, what a single mathematician can do. And we're trying to organize ourselves so that we can do more complex things and we're going to use machines. OK, so let me press on. Uh, a very interesting uh, development using formal mathematics um, appeared in 2012 and 13 when homotopy type theory was developed. And uh, we, uh, there I participated, we wrote a book. And uh, the introduction of the book makes it clear that we didn't just write the book because the mathematics was so new and we weren't really sure how to use the new foundation. We first did it in formalized mathematics. We first used proof assistants because they would guide us. They would make sure we didn't make any mistakes or that we imagined something that wasn't true. And after we gained enough experience using formal, formal mathematics and proof assistants, then we proceeded to unformalize everything we knew and wrote the book so that the rest of the mathematicians, including ourselves, could understand what was really going on. Um, there is a third, maybe the most important uh, reason for using formalized uh, for proof assistance and formalized, mathemat formalized mathematics, which is simply to recognize the immense potential that such approach can have. We're not there yet, but if you imagine a future in which machines can really help uh, mathematicians, you see that this future is going to be completely different. It will transform mathematics. And some people don't want to wait and they want to do it now and they are willing to devote their time to do it. And uh, Kevin Buzzard is uh, spearheading one such important uh, effort, which I'm going to um, also mention a little later. So, um, okay, but Okay, there are some enthusiasts who are doing this and computer scientists are doing their own thing, but will formalized mathematics go mainstream? I think this is completely the wrong question to answer. This is like thinking that computers are not going to uh, barge into mathematics and change it. Of course they will. The question is when will formalized mathematics go mainstream? Well, you could look at charts and say, okay, how is it growing? And uh, if you look at uh, one of the uh, libraries of uh, formal proofs, it's called Archive of Formal Proofs. It's growing uh, at a rapid pace in what looks like uh, an exponential growth. Uh, this is the kind of exponential growth that we can be happy about not for a change, not fear. And so we can say, well, OK, but I don't think, you know, it's, it's big. Maybe it'll grow bigger. I don't think it's really so much that the size matters. It's more that the potential for disruption is important. So to wrap up, I'm going to show you a little picture of what formalized mathematics looks like and how mathematicians work on it. We're going to see activities of mathematicians uh, working on the lean mathematical library called MathLib. This is the project that is led by Kevin Buzzard. And you will see little figures going around, that's mathematicians. And then there is a tree growing. That's the library files in the directory structure. And then there are, um, there are uh, these arrays. This means that the user has changed the file. You will see these flashes when a power user does something to all the files. And you can see the date, how it's growing 
This is what formalized mathematics looks like. It's pretty, right? It's nice. Uh, but does it tell us anything? Yes, I think it does. Watching this, you realize that this is not separate groups or two or three mathematicians, each belaboring on a paper on the, of their own. It's not like that. This is not anymore the medieval mathematicians guild, which is how mathematics is still organized today. This is a post-industrial division of labor. It is completely new. It's a math hive. It's exciting. And we haven't seen this sort of thing before. And I think it's going to change mathematics. When? Now. So as I was preparing the slides for this talk, an article in Nature came out and it bombastically said, mathematicians welcome computer assisted proofs in a grand unification theory. You know how it is with these popular science um, general audience papers, uh, articles. Well, behind it uh, is a blog post by Peter Scholze, who half a year ago posed a uh, challenge to the, um, to the formalization community, in particular to the Mathlib and the Lean community that I, I just showed them uh, their hive. Uh, he said, OK, here's an important theorem of mine. That's the one that he was belaboring and was worried whether it's true. Can you formalize this? And uh, only half a year later, uh, he said, this is amazing. It's been done. He expected that things will have to be carefully divided up and teams of people would work. But no, uh, a relatively small, uh, a small uh, uh, group of people took up the challenge and they formalized it in half a year, which is comparable, say, to uh, actively reviewing a complicated paper. Except that now, instead of just having the good word of the trusted anonymous reviewers, it is completely true, verified in every detail, and put on unshakable grounds. So I think this is a lot better. Um, it is the glimpse of the future. It's the true cooperation of man and machine. If you're curious and you'd like to try to know where to go and how to try things, I'm just going to point you in one direction. There are many proof assistants. So maybe if you are, are interested in constructive mathematics or computer science, you can go look at those other proof assistants. But if you are a, a mathematician uh, participating at the Congress, then I would say your best bet is to just go and find the lean community. They're a friendly bunch. They're working hard. It's growing. It's got thousands of users. And you can always find help on their chat system. So um, with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you. I suppose I can stop sharing now, right? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Andre, for a, a very nice talk. We'll uh, open the floor for a few questions here. Uh, I see Tomo already has his uh, hand raised. Uh, Andre, uh, can you tell me what is the meaning of that edge between the two clusters that you were showing, evolving clusters? Oh, uh, you mean uh, there was a tree? Yeah, what, has... what is that? There are yeah. two let's yes. say, separate things. Yes, I, yes, I can tell you. There was a larger, there was a large cluster, which was then connected by a long edge, uh, edge to a small cluster. The small cluster were administrative files, which describe what version of Lean it is, how to build, you know, build scripts, documentation on how to do things. And the large cluster was the actual formalization of mathematics. That was the actual division into topics and subtopics and so on. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Well, I, I have a loose question. Uh, I, I was, you talked about the relationship with uh, program verification. And uh, I was wondering if you could say a few words. So are you, uh, is this uh, closely related to verifying that a program is correct? Or closely related to verifying that a program won't uh, create a security problem with a memory overrun or both? Yes, it's all of that and also other things like the fact that the Paris Metro works correctly and is going this and that the semaphores are not going to crash to uh, two metros together. So computer scientists like to verify all kinds of things. 
for instance, they have been uh, verifying large chunks of hardware ever since the infamous Pentium division bug and even before that, but that's when it got really important. But yes, you're right. So um, there are I, the vast majority of software need not be it's not it's not economically viable to verify its correctness. Um, but there are critical components where, for instance, there is a great security risk or where it's important that some piece of software does not make an error. And for that, computer scientists are developing uh, methods for checking correctness, namely that the program does what it's supposed to do and doesn't do anything wrong. And uh, there, this is, this is uh, one important uh, area of computer science, which uh, is a lot larger than the, uh, commu the, the, for the community that formalizes mathematics. They are way ahead of uh, formalization of mathematics and they have their own custom methods and uh, approaches because the kind of theorems that they need to prove are not the kind of theorems that you would normally do in mathematics. Thank you. And I see uh, also two more raised hands. Uh, uh, Joao, you were first. OK, thank you very much, Russ. Hi, Andrew. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello, hello, Andre. Very, very nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about machine learning coming into the game uh, and particularly deep learning algorithms producing great new stuff and bringing the unexp unexplainability problem? Uh, this is a great question. And this, uh, these, these ideas are actively pursued uh, as we speak. Uh, several people, several teams are doing it. And I, I mean, of course, uh, you know, if we could get uh, machine learning to operate in uh, research mathematics at the level that it does, say, in chess, this would be absolutely amazing. Um, machine learning has, it hasn't killed chess. It raised it to new levels. Um, it helped humans, and it's going to be the same with machine learning. I hope to be, a, I firmly believe that I will see this future, that it's not going to take so long. Uh, but at the moment, I, I, I don't know when it's going to happen, but yes, people are working on this actively. Uh, there's uh, also a question from uh, Richard, Richard Ellis. Thank you very much. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, so I was thinking of the, uh, the four color uh, problem. Um, so this was a real milestone uh, theorem in mathematics, and we didn't really know it was true until it was verified. I'm wondering if there are other sort of problems like that floating around, sort of really important major problems, but we're really waiting for verification to, to land before we can be confident. Are you aware of um, any, in that sort of situation? I'm aware of, I'm aware of various theorems that have actually been successfully verified. There is this, uh, what is it, the Erdos discrepancy problem or something, where somebody produced formal proofs that are terabytes of data and they were formally checked to be correct and because that because of that they know that some combinatorial sequence of size i don't know i'm making this up 1243 exists but there is none of size 1244 and there are lists of these things where people are using uh, f uh proof assistance like that um you ask whether there are uh, proofs that are not quite trusted and where we would want to formalize them to trust them um, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now. I know that people are discovering that there are, for instance, um, proofs in uh, analysis where people use computers to uh, uh, estimate um, numerical values of, 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 of integrals and they just, uh, uh, those programs are faulty and so then people publish faulty bounds. So that's another area. This was, uh, this was some excellent work by Asiya Mabubi from Indria doing that, that sort of thing. So there are various areas where you can look. Thanks. Uh, there's an active discussion also going on in the, uh, in the chat here. Uh, there are uh, some questions. Um, the, uh, Let's see, I think the first one is from uh, uh, Yagup uh who asks about uh, whether this will do the same to uh, math as chess software did to 
chess. Uh, I think you might have addressed that already. Yeah, I saw that when I addressed it. But also I see now if I can uh, disrupt your uh, Katya Bercic is making a good point. Yes, there are people who are seriously thinking of formalizing the classification of finite simple groups. And that would be a very good example of a theorem where we kind of know it's true, but everybody would feel a lot easier if it were formalized. There's also some discussion about uh, how difficult uh, uh, this, um, these toolkits are to learn. Uh, 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 Huska asks uh, several questions and there's a, some active discussion. Uh, perhaps you might uh, weigh in on that. Okay, so I think um, what you need is good support from the community, which is why I uh, recommend Lean. It's also less arcane and a lot easier to get started in Lean. And they're making every effort to bring in the newcomers. It's not, you know, you're, you're mathematicians. You don't have a problem with uh, abstract thinking. So you can learn really fast. Uh, you just have to get used to certain kind of doing, th so for a certain way of doing it, things. And I should also warn you that once you start l learning proof assistance, you're going to learn a lot of mathematics that you thought you knew. You will be uh, become aware of various kinds of details that maybe were not so clear um, because you could always sweep them under the rug. So there is a little bit of learning on that side, on, on that front. But the software is not is not out of the question. So for instance, I would say it's a nice summer project if you want to get acquainted, do it over the summer, try to do a little bit, you know, prove an easy theorem and see how it goes. Uh, Katya's uh, hand is up. Hello, Andre. Thank Hello. you for the very nice talk. I have a question that's been bugging me. So many people are trying to automate the transfer of libraries between proof assistants. Uh, and it looks like Lean might be so far ahead that that might become irrelevant. And I wonder, um, what do you think how this is going to play out? Right. So indeed, I think this year, uh, a European cost network, including more than 20 countries, is uh, being organized. It's called EU ProofNet, uh, where people will uh, uh, consider and uh, work on interoperability of formal proofs. Namely, one of the big problems is that you have a formal proof in one system and then you want to use it in another system, but you can't because they're incompatible. So this is a big problem for interoperability and it's similar to interoperability of software. Many of the uh, challenges we're facing are software-like software, software -like problems. Um, you ask me to predict the future. Well, I think it's easy. It's going to be like in every other area. There's going to be a, there's going to be a winner. It will take 85% of the market. And then there will be a second place. It will take 10% of the market. And then there will be the small fish, which is everybody else. Um, who is going to be the winner? I don't know. It looks like Lean is making great leaps. So probably lean. If I had to put my bet on it, I'd say it's lean at the moment. Well, with that, uh, I see uh, questions uh, petering out. Uh, I believe we can leave this uh, Zoom session open, uh, but uh, we'll point out that the uh, next invited talk uh, started a minute or two ago. Um, uh, let's uh, formally close and perhaps Andre will uh, stay around and uh, sure, chat with people around, that yes. are interested. Thanks, Russ. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. That's great. So are pe can people just speak up if they want to? Is that open? Am I a co-host? What am I? Uh, I think you're a panelist. I'm a co-host and I'll stay around. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, the IT support person uh, may stay around. Um, um, so uh, anyone that on, is, uh, yeah, anyone that is a panelist can just speak up. Uh, and there's only one attendee. Uh, and I think uh, we invited them to prom be promoted and they uh, did not accept. Okay. So Jakub asked what, whether formalization will do what to mathematics, what chess software did to chess community. Yes, I think it's going to be uh, once you have machines which are, uh, which outrank 
the best research mathematicians, I think that's going to be an amazing world to live in. Um, some people are scared of it, but I'm not. I think it's going to be amazing. Um, we're going to learn a lot. If anybody has a question, they should probably raise their hand, right? Yes, people are mentioning the odd order theorem. This was another important milestone. It was also formalized by Georges Contier and his team. Uh, this one was especially um, educational. They learned a lot about how to formalize mathematics. This was, I think, what was completed in 2012, something like that. I don't know. Um, they learned how to organize libraries and uh, it, was, it was an important milestone. Oh, there's somebody saying they're contributing to Mathlib, so maybe they can tell. I have only looked at the Mathlib. I mean, I, 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 I've used Lean a little bit. I'm, I'm a much more at home with uh, Agda and, and Koch. But um, uh, if anybody wants to share their experience with the Mathlib and the Lean community, go ahead. And somebody, jo uh, Johan, uh, is pointing out that Lean already has some theorems that were proved using machine learning and the resulting proofs were shorter than the human ones. So it's happening. I, I mean, of course, we only included the proofs that, that, like the machine found several proofs and we only accepted those that were shorter than the ones we already had. Sure, sure. So, sure. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like, know, it's not like all the proofs it found were shorter. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, and I mean, people have made all sorts of experiments. For instance, they would take a large library and they would run uh, machine learning on it to see how many they, the machine could uh, uh, do by itself and it, you know, it was something like 40% and then the next year it was 55% and the numbers are going up. Um, we're nowhere close to what uh, chess software can do to chess players. I'm, I'm curious about these uh, machine learning produced proofs. Um, can you tell us if how they compared in readability to human produced? Uh, you're not asking me, right? I mean, so um, like these are typically proofs of theorems where if you look at the statement, you think, okay, this is obviously true. And then the proof goes down from four or five lines to three lines or two lines. And we, we sort of have the philosophy in, in MathLib where if the theorem is obvious, then we don't care whether the proof is readable. We just want it to be so short that you can immediately see the next theorem because what's important when, you, when you're when you trying to find the, a, a useful lemma, you want, just want to fit as many lemmas on one screen so that you can quickly find the right lemma. So if lemmas and theorems are obvious, then we just try to make the proof as short as possible and we don't care at all about whether the proof is readable. Of course, for the like bigger, lemmas and theorems that you that you would actually write down in a mathematical textbook we take more care and and try to sort of write a proof in a way that is at least for someone who is experienced with lean is is easy to follow um and then uh those are typically not the kind of proofs where the machine learning algorithm already finds shorter shorter things but By it's funny way, mm -hmm, sorry yeah? no keep, keep going keep going sorry I mean, what, what I found especially funny is that these machines, of course, don't care at all about what is considered trivial or hard mathematics. I, I had written up a, a formalization of width vectors, which is considered to be a sort of pretty technical construction in, in algebra slash ring theory. And the algorithm just dived in and, and made some proof shorter. <laughs> Whereas I, I don't think it has any understanding of what it is doing, but it just knows how to manipulate these theorems and proofs. And it said, oh, wait, if you combine things in this way, then you get a shorter proof. So, yeah. But it, I mean, yeah, this, this becomes philosophical, but it, like these machine learning algorithms like GPT, they write amazing essays on the internet. Do they understand what they're doing? I think eventually I we're going to stop asking that question. I was just going yeah. to make an, a, a small point. We keep talking about proofs, proofs, proofs. But in fact, I think about half of mathematics is not proofs, it's constructions. And this is one important bit about uh, type theory is that it emphasizes this point 
Um, if you just learn first order logic, then uh, logical statements are primary and constructions are secondary. But if you open, Euc if you look at Euclid's elements, you will see that of the first uh, several theorems, about half of them are really constructions. They don't even say that something is the case. Uh, one, they say things like, uh, the first proposition, I think, says to erect an equilateral triangle on a given segment. So it's not even saying that it doesn't say there exists a triangle. It says to erect a triangle, right? And this is an this is something that is maybe not so captured in such a good way in in the traditional formalisms, but uh, is necessary for good work with proof assistants. Somebody asks uh, whether there are under underrepresented uh, parts of mathematics, and we already have an answer that probability theory may be one. Uh, in MathLib, I would say more generally, the more remote you are from computer science, the more um, underrepresented it will be. Because computer science is such a huge consumer of formalized mathematics that it'll gobble up everything that it can and it'll produce lots and lots of things that it cares about. And so there will be huge amounts of formal proofs about all kinds of formal systems and programming languages because the programming languages people like to do that sort of thing so that's overrepresented but yeah take something like uh, probability theory or uh, so uh, like uh, you know try to find uh, formal proof of the borel determinacy that's probably a bit hard <laughs> Okay, I need to leave the bedroom of my daughter because she has to work on her homework. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> but thanks a lot for your talk. This was great. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I hope to meet you in real life at some point. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> well is... now, you know, I'm vaccinated. You are vaccinated or something. We'll meet. I'm halfway. I'm okay. halfway. Yeah. Good luck. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye. How did you do the um, uh, the, the animation? Ah, it's a program called GORS. G O U R S C E. Uh, let me okay. it in the chat. I did it. Ah, oh, there you go. Okay. It's a nice, it's a nice program. What it does, it it reads the uh, commit log from Git from the Git repository and then creates the um, the animation. Ah, that's why it, it uh, didn't only show up on the actual Git. You yeah, can just run really it nice. and then it shows you the animation on the screen. It's kind of fun to watch. Oh, if you if you want to be humbled, you think if you think that Mathlib is a, is a hive, you should try the same animation for the Linux operating system and then you will understand that we are all just very, very small fish. We're just a speck <laughs> in the universe. Because Linux is really so huge that we are still far away from being anywhere close to that size. Yeah, I can beat it. Yeah, great talk. Thank you. Russ, did you tell Andre about his talk yet? What, what? <laughs> hmm? You promised to tell a comment uh, on Andre's talk. Ah, he forgot about it. No, yeah. Andre had a comment Russia. about something some chair said, and then Russ said, "Oh, I'll do that." Oh, I see. Okay. Right, you were a great speaker. I didn't even have to cut you off. <laughs> Thanks for not cutting me. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't going to cut you off. Well, you would have had to go pretty crazy uh, uh, for me to do something like that. Um, yeah. Are we winding Occasionally down here? Someone I, think, gets, uh, I think we're definitely gets interprets. I think we're winding down. Yeah, I think we've here. wound uh, wound yeah. down. I was going to say I, I'm thinking about hopping off here. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Well, I thanks for uh, thank thank thanks for being an excellent chair. You didn't even cut me off. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll see okay. you in the bye bye everybody. Days. It's good to see bye. you. Bye. Yeah. Yeah.